Next up is Steve Safferman, and he is going to talk to us about macropore characterization to enable the selection of practices that minimize soluble phosphorus loss. That is a mouthful. There you go. Great. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. So I do want to recognize my co-authors, uh, Jason Smith. He's an instructor at the Michigan State University and earning his PhD, and this is part of his PhD work, just like the last presentation. Thai met Sophie Yape, who's an undergraduate researcher, and Asan Guan, who's an extension faculty within our department. So I want to spend a few minutes on the premise on why we're looking at macro pars and why we think it's so important. And this has to do, again, with this phosphorus issue in freshwater lakes. And interesting statistics, and I'll show you some data on this in a few minutes, that particulate phosphorus um, has been reduced to the Great Lakes. And however, soluble phosphorus levels are increasing. It's a little bit unclear why that's the case. And remember that soluble phosphorus is a, is a big problem because it's 100% bioavailable. Particulate phosphorus is only 20% bioavailable, so a little bit of soluble phosphorus can have a very, very large impact. And again, ag has been named as a significant contributor to soluble phosphorus. So the studies that seem to be indicating this um, and on the other hand, farmers don't want to lose phosphorus. It's uh, more scarce than oil, and the prices fluctuates more than oil. So it's actually a very valuable resource that's technically non-renewable, because once we lose it in the bottom of our rivers and, 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 and deep in the soil, we can't really recover, at least not easily. And so the problem is a lot of best management practices have always emphasized particulate phosphorus. In fact, some of them might even um, have a negative impact in terms of releasing more soluble phosphorus at the expense of reducing particulate phosphorus. So I think the new par paradigm has to be looking at all site-specific conditions before making decisions on best management practices. And this graph just shows you the imbalance of research. So the, the red line is on phosphorus keyword search on articles that have been published about phosphorus, and the blue is on soluble phosphorus. And so I really consider soluble phosphorus as an emerging issue as we're still not doing a lot of research on it, yet um, we think it's causing a lot of issues. So um, some of you have seen these, these, these exact pictures before in the impact of the soluble phosphorus. And talk about the one on the bottom left, and that's the Toledo uh, intake for their, their water, drinking water. And so this is um, a drinking water system that serves 400,000 people and there was so much cyanobacteria, blue-green algal growth in it, that they had to shut the system down for two and a half days, and you couldn't even boil the water because of the, um, the airborne release of the microcysteine, which is a byproduct from the cyanobacteria, which is toxic to humans. So it's incredible to think of a whole municipality, I think it's about the 30th largest in the country, being shut down because of cyanobacteria that was probably uh, due to soluble phosphorus. So this is just some of the data I, I, I mentioned. So this is done out of Heidelberg University, David Baker. So he's done a great job in collecting data over many, many different years. And you can see the trend of particulate phosphorus on two tributaries going to the Great Lakes, going down. But very interestingly, we can see Cybor was going down into the, into the 90s. And then it looks like it started to go up. So it, there's been a lot of debate on why uh, we were reducing soluble phosphorus and then it increasing, and it could have been implementation of some best management practices. There was actually a different, um, there was a changeover of type of phosphorus being used, um, and so different theories, but I don't know if I've seen any, any unifying reason why this is, uh, if we know why it's happening exactly. So why, um, where is this phosphorus coming from? Obviously commercial fertilizer, manure applications, and then cover crops, I do want to talk a little bit about cover crops as a quick aside, because this is again another example of a best management technology that works great for certain site specific conditions. In other conditions it might not. And we have found that freezing and thawing of cover crops absolutely releases soluble phosphorus. There's been quite a few studies showing this, and this is actually directly from my lab. And we can see that with three replicates, with the control without freeze and thaw, the releases of total and soluble and with freeze and thaw conditions. So again, three replicates. And this again is very, very dependent on the Pacific. So this was ryegrass. We also have some preliminary data in for um, some winter wheat. But the, um, the, the, it's also dependent on the, the age of the plants. So if the plants at maturity, we're going to release less phosphorus than if it's actively growing when we have a freeze. So again, some things to think about. Um, again, cover crops have a very good basis for many situations. but. If we're worried about soluble phosphorus 
and we have tidal drain, we could have issues. And that's the second part of this, the transport of soluble phosphorus. So if we're producing it by some means or another, how is it moving? And um, the big issue is macropores, and these are basically direct pipes into shallow groundwater, or they could be direct pipes into tidal drainage. And um, you can see that we, this is what we want in terms of simulating um, nutrients with a dye. We want a kind of a matrix flow. What we don't want are these fingers uh, of that dye going straight down, and it can go down very quickly. In one of our excavation sites, we hit a tile by accident, and the dye was already in the tile after just a short period of time. It, moved, it moves very, very quickly. And tile drains prevalent in certain parts of the country, especially around the Great Lakes, so the red is the maximum number of, of, of um, tile drains, so 60 to 100 percent of the land in the red areas are tile drained, um, obviously down to zero, which is, is the, the, white, um, the white locations. So throughout the whole country, there's, there's a fair amount of tile drain, but it's specifically around some of the fresh body water, waters. And again, if this is shallow, um, having soluble nutrient go down two or three feet, three or four feet, um, is, is, it could be very, very easy, very common with these, these conduits. So, based on work by four, we, we um, modified slightly some of the research that had been done by that research group to look at trying to understand the transport of soluble phosphorus um, through macropores, because if we're going to do any modeling, especially on a field-to-field -field basis where you might be making very specific decisions if we can apply or not apply cover crops or manure, we have to know um, what's going on with the macro pores. So we wanted to come up with a quantifiable way to measure the extent um, and, the, and the amount of macro pores. And so again, using this method that was already developed and with some slight modifications, we start with a one meter by one meter field plot and apply um, basically blue dye and then we irrigate overnight as if it was a typical rain event. And then what we do is we excavate the site and we put in this panel and this panel has basically um, 10 centimeter squares. And we, we do this after 12 hours, and we usually do this in triplicate. And then with this panel in place, we take a photograph, and then we use image processing software to de-skew the, the figure. So if you look here, taking a picture from up top, unless we made a really large trench, you can see that each box is not coming out equal. Um, even though it is in real life, so we can de-skew it and make each box equal. And we can also enhance the colors, so now you can see pretty clearly where the dye is going down, again representing a soluble nutrient going through macropores. And then what we can do is assign a black or a white color and actually come up with the macropores, macropores being in white and then everything else being in black. And we can normalize this to a thousand by thousand pixels and actually count the pixels and count them with depth. So this graph, um, this table shows the um, various sites that we, we demonstrated using MATCAD. We counted the pixels, and um, this is the fraction of dye at depths going down. So if we look at some of those numbers, um, we can see there's some pretty, uh, pretty big differences. We're at the end on a tillage site with organic. We basically have nothing going beyond 50 centimeters where in this case we have a, um, a non-till loan and we're going down pretty deep. So again, this is getting at a best management practice of till versus no-till. And uh, again, a, a very good technology to prevent particulate phosphorus movement, but having large macro pars that serve as conduits, especially in tile drain fields, could be, um, could be a serious issue of the, that phosphorus moving straight down into those tile drains. We can also represent it graphically, as shown in, in this graph for one of the, one of the sites. Um, and again, our goal is to quantify this ultimately and put it in models. We're not at that point yet, but we actually have now have numbers on distribution of the of the um, macro pores. And so, this is basically a summary of um, several sites that we looked at, and I can go through it quickly. Um, again, this is what we don't want. We don't want these fingers or these direct conduits. And under the no-till conditions, you can see we're getting that condition. Um, what we want is this matrix kind of effect. And even on heavy clays, a little bit of a surprise, but I guess it should not have been. We're still getting the kind of the preferential flow. 
And that's probably because the clay is so tight, the only movement is gonna be through um, macropores. It's gonna be through porosity. It's just not gonna move otherwise. Um, it's not gonna go through matrix flow. But on this tilled organic soil, we actually see what we wanna see. It's kind of matching here, where we don't have, um, we don't have the, the, the dye going down to deep depths. And it's pretty evenly distributed at the top layer where the root zone is. So based on this, and I, I should recognize that this was funded by the Michigan Soybean um, Promotion Group, and they funded a second project to um, expand the work. And we wanted to um, actually be able to go out and test a lot of sites very easily, as easily as, as possible. So we developed a mobile macropore unit, which I'll show you pictures of in a few minutes. And then we also wanted to produce some guidance, and we're calling it the Practice Selector for Nutrient Retention Tool which is more or less a qualitative tool. And again, it's at a failed level now instead of a, of a, of a, of a, um, a region or a county or a farm level. So each field, uh, any farm could be very, very different. It might be more suited for applications and different practices than other fields on the same farm. And we're also using some hydrous modeling, so, so finite element modeling, as well as um, some cover crop studies that we're doing to try to come up with this guidance. And this is just a sample of some output we, um, we, we actually develop, developed through the hydrous modeling. So again, our goal is then to incorporate um, all of our data um, into this modeling, including on the cover crop leaching and the macro pores for different sites. And then um, we're gonna demonstrate this um, at the um, Center of Excellent Farms in Michigan. So this is an Edgerfield monitoring site that also has tile drain. And we can, we can monitor both the tile drain and the, the, the material that runs off at that field. And then the ultimate goal is to give it to our extension educators so they can use it um, in their programming. And then as we collect data, we'll track that data and improve our tools as we obtain more and more information. So this is what our um, mobile macro park characterization unit looks like. So basically a trail with everything on it that's needed to actually do these experiments. So there's actually um, capacity to do four sites at one time. And so we first had to develop the irrigation system and looked at uniformity testing to develop the best configuration. So this is just some spray nozzles in those cups there are just to measure uniformity and looked at several different options. And you can see in this case, we had a lot of water going outside the box and finally decided on um, a very traditional uh, configuration with several spray headers um, and distributed evenly throughout the, the, the three meter plot. And so that's um, um, all on this trailer. So we have four of these setups that can be hooked up to each their own pump and own water source. And then we have our own generators on that trailer and then the, the, the water, the pump for that water. And we even have a mini excavator that looks like a lot of fun. We haven't used it um, for real yet because we built this through the winter, but we will be going out in a couple of weeks and um, device to tow it around. So with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes? Um, your organic soil, the profile, is, is there any characteristics like uh, percent of organic content in the soil? Or, uh, we, we have not, yeah, we have not characterized the soil. It was more experimentation, but our goal will be to, to as, we, as we do more demonstrations, to characterize the soil and start making some of those correlations. So this, these were some sites that we just um, throughout Michigan that we had we had tried this on. Yes. How long had the no-till site been in a no-till? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question because I, I guess it's been explained. Oh yes, how how long were those sites in no-till? And I guess there's um, no such thing as true no-till in some ways. And um, I apologize, I cannot give you the exact time. But they were, um, it was, I don't, if I remember correctly, it wasn't more than a couple seasons where they were no-till. Um, and so there is um, there's definitely a big question about how to define no-till. And then also, there's also questions about positioning this. Are we over a tile versus between tiles? So lots of questions that we haven't answered yet. Yes? So it looked like the dyes made it down to about a foot, foot and a half? Um, the dye could go down easily four feet. Um, when we broke the, yeah, when we broke the tile, it was four feet down there, and into the pipe. But it seemed like a lot of your graphs show that it only went down like foot, foot and a half. How did, how would it get down to the tile, rest of the way going through matrix flow? Would it be perhaps that the 
consortium sites are already saturated with other anions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, could, would, the, would the dye, or in this case, the soluble phosphorus ever go below the, the root zone if we have matrix flow? And, the, and we would, we would, um, the goal would be for not going down because otherwise we lose um, the use of that phosphorus. So the goal would be to apply it in such that um, it would be in the root zone because of the absorption capability of that soil, and then it would desorb for the plant growth and then re reapply it. Um, but again, that's really complicated too. They've, they've found that soil applied in one season might not even be used for plant uptake until the next season or even beyond that. Um, but we, um, the, I don't think the matrix flow, the, the, the thought is that if it's matrix flow, unless you're completely saturated so with, with phosphorus, it wouldn't go down and hit the tile. But if it was, um, if it was that um, preferential flow with, with macro pores, then it, then it would definitely hit the tile. It could definitely hit the tile. Yes. So the, the, the original idea was to test to see if soluble soil, soluble phosphorus is reaching surface water, correct? Um, reaching the tiles that then go to surface water, yes. Oh, okay. Right, so it, it's, it's the, um, the, the type of finding that if you have a, a failed and it's not tiled or the tiles are very deep and um, then, then and especially if you have maybe a slope and you're worried about surface water nearby then cover traps I think are definitely going to be the, um, a, a good technology but if you have shallow tile three feet down um, and, and then you don't have any, um, if it's the ideal location you don't have any um, surface water nearby you might not want to do cover traps because of that risk of the soluble phosphorus going down. So again, that's kind of what, we, what we're trying to, to look at, site-specific condition, you know, realizing that every field, every soil is different and has, will have different characteristics. Yeah, I had uh, one question related to the, you had a map that showed the drainage, concentration of drainage tile area. Is that, cor is that correlated to the, the level of soluble P in the rivers or? The yeah, so um, there's, there, there, there's been um, definitely conclusions that, that ag and tile drains is contributing. Um, it is a little bit controversial, and I honestly have not read those reports in detail, um, but, but they, they definitely have shown correlations. Again, I don't know if they're statistically proven, but there seems to be th that link. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, did we test the soils, if I understand it, to see um, the, 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 um, the, the, perhaps the capability of the, so the soil to absorb the soluble phosphorus? Um, and we did not on, on that data. That's something that we will do in the, in the upcoming study. Um, but the premise is that um, it, when we have um, macropores, even if we have a good soil capability to absorb the phosphorus or even if it's not saturated with phosphorus, these are literally direct conduits straight down. And so a percentage of that soluble phosphorus will, will most likely go down. At least that's a hypothesis regardless of the soil condition with this macropores. I think roots are a big picture, a, a big, a big problem, um, or a big cause, I should say. Earthworms could be a cause, also. Um, if, if, if the soil, in certain types of soil, gets really dried out and starts cracking, that could be another source. But the main one that um, that we, we mainly consider would be the earthworms and the roots. All right, let's give them.